Bible. How many of you have a Bible like that? Is a Bible? Okay, that's cool. That's awesome. It really helps. Uh, it does a little bit about that. Um, it wasn't one of those standard features that came with the Bible, like chapters and verses. We added those things. We added chapters and verses so that we could find it again and we could locate where it was at. And uh, Louis Klopsch, I have no idea if I'm saying it right. It's very German, so it's got sound to it probably. 1852 to 1910, enterprising immigrant and journalist. Lewis left school early, and by age 20 was editing a merchant's trade journal, journalist newspaper. He enhanced the columns by inter intercepting or interspersing Bible passages in the text, and he managed to buy a print shop, became a successful publisher. In 1890, he was American editor of the British Weekly, The Christian Herald. In his teens, he met up with a captivated preacher by the name of Reverend Dwight Talmadge. Really had an influence in his life. Later, he made Talmadge an editor of his paper. Conceived the idea of distributing the sermons in hundreds of newspapers. And then on June 19, 1899, while composing an editorial, his eye fell upon this passage. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which I shed for you. And seizing upon this symbolism, Lewis asked Dr. Townish if Christ's words could not be printed in red. And his mentor replied, it could do no harm, and it most certainly could do much good. And those of you that touch the Bible and open it up and see not only in the New Testament the letters of Jesus written in red, but you'll also find some of the things that Jesus said in the Old Testament written in red. Like, all of a sudden you read, like, wait, why is that written in red? Because Jesus said it. Somebody took the time to identify it, and that's where it came from. Inspired. The Sermon on the Mount, the longest piece of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. Like one section of Scripture, all in red, three chapters. First verse opens up by saying this. Now, when they saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. That's how it starts. Found a mountain, found some people, started talking. And it's forever changed how we think and what we do. Three chapters long, only 17 minutes long. Man, he needs to come and preach at this church. 17 minute sermon filled with some of the hardest teachings ever given. His red words changed how we live, how we serve, how we pray, how we love, how we forgive, how we live and die, and how we talk. That's why I'm referring to the Sermon on the Mount as the most gripping, compelling, life-changing, best-read letter sermon ever. If I could find more stuff to stick in there, I would. It's the best thing ever said. Yet it's the hardest thing to ever do. But we're still called to do it. Red letter edition of the Bible was formed, and Jesus' words are now there. His words are timeless. His words are energized and stirring and galvanized. They motivated out of love. His words were precious. Were all those things there because they were inspired. This is God talking now. For three chapters, God speaks to us and says, Sit down while I talk to you for a minute about how your life would just be better if you just did this. And I don't mean better, like, oh, my life's going to be so no problem. That's not what I'm talking about. Just how we go about living life would be better. And in this first part of the Beatitudes, there are many people that spend a whole series on nothing but this verse text that we're going to look at, because there's so much packed in these 12 verses, these eight beatitudes about how we're supposed to live our life, that you just have to take them apart, these might be something to mash it all together and do it all one time. And by doing so, it's going to kind of give us a glimpse of a little bit of what Ralph Ellison said in his book, The Invisible Man. Anybody read The Invisible Man in school? We had to do that one. In The Invisible Man, this is what was posed as a statement, when I discover who I am, I'll be free. And over the next several weeks, we're going to try to discover who we are so that we can be free. And so, I uh, point out of a moment that I've asked some people to help me with. If you have suckers in the house right now, I'm going to ask you to start distributing right now. So, let's do that. Um, you're all going to need a pussy pop uh, right now. And, and I would love for all of you to suck on it uh, in the service. You're like, wow, that's just getting convenient right today. No, you get a pussy pop as well. And uh, so I think it's going to be cool for all of us to have the sticks stuck out of our mouth uh, while, we're, while we're taking notes and, and talking. And uh, just so you're clear, 
Uh, I don't like the chocolate part of the center of a tissue roll thing, so I have a low pop, but I'm looking forward to my center as well. Alright? Now while I'm stuck in a mind, which I don't get to do much of, because it's really hard to do both of these at the same time, although I sound like that anyway, I want to turn your attention to a screen. Some of you may have remembered this one from a long time ago, a commercial about the very thing of getting in your hand. See if this doesn't bring up some other screen. Mr. Cap, how many minutes does it take to get into the dirty roll center of a dirty pop? I don't know. I always end up hiding. Ask Mr. Fox, for he's much cleverer than I. Mr. Fox, how many minutes does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Why don't you ask Mr. Turtle, for he's been around a lot longer than I. Me? I find. Mr. Turtle, how many minutes does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? I ain't never made it without writing. Ask Mr. Owl, for he is the wisest of us all. Mr. Owl, how many minutes does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? A good question. Let's find out the one, the two, the three, the three. If there's anything I can't stand, it's a smart owl. How many minutes does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? The world may never know. Okay, so this is one of those science fair experiments, right? You gotta lick them all, try to figure out how many. Somebody told me first they actually did this whenever this commercial came out, and they did it in 67. I'm like, wow, that's a big time to do it in 67. But if you choose to buy it, Dr. Nelson is in the house, and so um, he'll take care of you if that's what you're choosing to do. Thank you for fixing what we destroyed. Um, enjoy, your, enjoy your Tootsie Pop. Here's the thing there's something good at the center, and you don't. That's why you're sucking on it. You can't wait to get to that moment. In fact, you're trying to discover how you can roll it on your tongue, maybe you're even, your receivers have to be even. And you just want that whole thing to be open before you can finally get it off. So you just want to go right for it and bite into it. Whichever you do, there's goodness in the center. There's blessing in the center. The same is true about these beatitudes that Jesus is giving us. At the very center of what's going on is the core of who you are. And I pray that your center, your center, has a color. And your color of your center is covered in the red blood of Christ Jesus. I know it sounds weird it's not going to suffer right now, but I pray that the color that's in your center is red. So I have three ways of dividing up the steps in blessings. Blessings that come from different Beatitudes. And the first set of blessings that we're going to see in the Beatitudes is blessings centered in finding God. See, Jesus tosses out the word blessed. The word implies that it's, that it's, that it's one doing the blessing is God. That he is favoring us. That he is honoring us. Yes, that's absolutely true. Blessed is a passive term, though. Here's the thing, when we follow these things, we get it. We just get blessed. And so, we like to think that blessings would come to those who are full and complete and overflowing. In other words, you get a blessing because it's a reward. Like getting to the center of your Tootsie Pop. Like, hey, I get a prize because I've been good. That's not what these blessings do. In fact, it's confusing. Jesus says, you'll be blessed when you're empty. You'll be blessed when you're incomplete. You'll be blessed when you're lacking. That's weird. Finding God, he wants us to choose these things and what's at our center. So here's the first three in regards to finding God. Verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I, I, I put out your page with a Jesus word and a world word. And I'm going to give you the world one first, okay? So if anybody gets mixed up, the world one's going to go first in regards to what you see on the paper. The world says this word, pride, when they hear poor in spirit. Pride. The world would say, blessed are the self-righteous, the self-confident, the conceited. The world says all that you have and everything you own is earned by your own efforts and your own hard work. It's about you. That's what they would say. But Jesus says it's about humility. It's about humility. He refers to a spiritual beggar. Not seeing one of those at the uh, highway intersection recently. I'm poor in spirit. <coughs> Could you help me with a little bit of something? But isn't that what we are doing here? We're all holding our cardboard signs saying, I am in desperate need of some help. Can someone please help me? That's being poor in spirit. Martin Luther said it this way, God 
created everything out of nothing. And therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of it. That's poor in spirit. And, and alcohol, alcohol is synonymous, AA is easier for you to say. Uh, the first step is that you have to admit that you're powerless over your problem. You can't do your problem without some help from somebody. That's being poor in spirit. Imagine two people who owe $10 million, and for repayment, one of them has $1,000, and the other one has $1. $1,000 is 1000 times better than the other guy, but both of them are shy of the $10 million they need. That's spiritually bankrupt. That's what we are. Some of us come in with a dollar, some of us come in with a thousand, but all of us need ten million if we don't have it. A spiritually bankrupt. Poor in spirit. The broken in heart are the ones that he wants to look for. We're utterly dependent in every area of our life for him. We ought to be saying this. Jesus, I can't stay married apart from you. Jesus, I can't raise my children apart from you. Jesus, I can't work my job apart from you. Jesus, I need you, and without you, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. So here's a little take home for you. You can't be filled with God when you're full of yourself. There's not room for both of you there. It's either you or him. You poor in spirit. Exit yourself out and allow him to be in. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, some of you know this by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I always acknowledge him and you might pass straight. Some of you love the first part of that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I'm asking you to pay attention to the very second part. And lean not on your own understanding. That is poor in spirit. You can't trust in God without leaning on stuff you don't get. You're going to let him do it. Second one here in regards to finding God. Those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The world would say, the word is pleasure. The world would say, blessed are the aggressive, the violent, the forceful, the insistent, those who want to please themselves. But Jesus, his word is repentance. I know that word is not found in this verse, but understand something. In context, the word mourn refers to us mourning over sin. It's the last time you cried over sin in your life. Or over the sin in someone else's life. Because sin causes pain to someone. Now those of us who are sinning and saying, I'm not hurting anyone but myself, you're still hurting somebody? Sin causes pain. Sin hurts. And we should mourn the lack of righteousness in ourselves and in our churches. And in our society, we should long for the moment when God eliminates sin and he ushers in his perfect just, justice whenever he says it's finished. Our Christian bond manifests itself in what we cry over and what we laugh about. So often we laugh at the things we should cry over and we weep over the things that we should laugh at. What are you weeping about? What are you laughing about? Here's a little take home for you. Repentance is necessary before restoration can occur. We say here at Fairfield, along with what God's Word has to say, that you need to believe, repent, and be baptized. Some of you have said, I've done that. Awesome. Believe, repent, and be baptized. But you know, there are some that have believed and been baptized, and they still have yet to repent. They haven't looked at their sin, they haven't examined themselves and said, I'm in a spot and I need to stop. I need to quit. Without repentance, you just got wet. Restoration comes when you find sorrow in your sin. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That's the first part of the text, but then it comes this huge part at the very end. That times of refreshing may come. So it's more than just the fact that he's going to take my sins away whenever I say, I am a sinner and I'm blowing it big time. But there's times of refreshing. So let me ask you, what area of your life do you need to change direction in? You know what it is. I need to point it out. You know what area you need to change direction in? Here's the third piece out of the Beatitudes for us. Verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, 
or they will inherit the earth. The world will say, power is the word. Power, power. The world will say, blessed are those who prosper at any cost as they achieve results and pushing themselves to the front. Jesus says, meekness. Now, I say meekness, and most of the men here kind of ruin this. I am not going to be meek, because that means meek. Let me tell you what meek really means, so that you get it. Because a lot of people looked at Jesus when he said, be meek, in a world where they wanted him to be king over a kingdom, and said, wait a minute, did he just say he wants us to be meek? We want to make him king. We want to make him lord. We want to make him powerful. We want to take on the Romans. They didn't get it. Here's what meek or gentle means. It means to bridle wild horses. Y'all remember that stallion in you? I want it my way. You can't control me. You can't tell me what to do. Remember that? Meekness is allowing God to put a bridle on you, a saddle on you, for you to trust Him. Trust in His will, doing it His way. Is the Lord your refuge? Do you trust him implicitly about everything? Here's an illustration for you. There's a golfer getting ready to go. He is, he is shot, puts his ball down, gets ready to swing. And from the announcement, PA system comes over the loudspeaker because someone in the clubhouse sees this guy and says, Would the man who is getting ready to tee off at the women's tee kindly move back to the men's tee? And he looks up at the golf, golf club clubhouse and goes back to address his ball and gets ready to set up again and once again over the same PA. Would the man who's teeing off the women's tee kindly move back to the men's tee? And he throws his club in the air and looks at the man at the PA and he said, would the man on the PA kindly shut up so I can hit my second shot? <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm sitting at the women's tee in my journey with Christ and I wonder when I, why I take me out there. I want to hit a good one, but I'm still hitting my second shot. Meekness is recognizing I need to be tamed and I need to be bridled. And when I do, I find contentment with the situation where God puts me. The results of meekness is contentment. Centering your life on the blessings that come in finding Him. Psalm chapter 37, verse 11 uses the word meek again. It says, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. There are people that will preach this text incorrectly as though be meek and you'll get stuff. Be meek and things will come your way. A new car will happen for you. But another word for peace and prosperity is contentment. And I want you to find great contentment by being meek, by being vital, by, being, by submitting every day to the Lord's will. Then these next three pieces are blessings that are centered in experiencing God. These next three Beatitudes are how we get to know Him. Jesus in your sentence is everyone else in our present situation. He says, in spite of those uncomfortable and undesirable things that are existing in life, you can experience God and live blessed. And the enemy wants us to forget and overlook the fact that we're blessed. We actually discover that blessings come when we're centered on experiencing God. So here's the next three. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Huh. Who doesn't want to be full from the last meal you just had? Huh. So full. Oh, this was a good meal, right? Hunger and thirst for God. Here's the world's version. Personal satisfaction. The world wants us to get whatever we can. The world says, blessed are the scrupulous and the deceitful and the devious. Every man for himself as they are persuasive and they get things done. Jesus works righteousness. Jesus doesn't say he's looking for people who possess righteousness. Woo. Good call. He's looking at the wrong place. But he's looking for us all to be righteous people. And he's looking for people who don't have it yet and want it. Like everything in them, they want it. You remember the last time that you were really hungry and thirsty for something? I mean, you were distracted from whatever else that you were attempting to do. Some of you are feeling this right now. Like, I'm distracted. It's going to get good. Don't get drink. I'm not going to be able to focus. And so we, we, we look. I mean, we, we search. And we try to find a person who is hungry and thirsty. Just push everything else aside. They are desperate. It is their top priority. is satisfying this hunger and thirst. Today, some of my home refer to this as hangry. And angry and hungry at the same time. I'm hangry. I'm not going to 
Mary and Mary. No, it's like, that's this desperate spot for righteousness we're supposed to go after. Yesterday, we were able to spend time celebrating the life of a woman who turned 80, mother who turned 80. And uh, I, I, I was thinking about this part, and I was thinking about how much we all need to devote ourselves to the Word of God. That's really how we're going to find righteous stuff. Get yourself to the Word of God. And my mother-in-law is so busy that I have to find out what day. She's not going to a Bible study. She's in a Bible study every day. And I know this about her. It's not just because she likes all of you, but she does. I also know that she takes to heart this verse. Her word is a lamp to my feet. And the light is in my path. Just sing that in the song that we've chosen for our series. And the ground beneath my feet, we sang. The word of God is the ground that I walk on. I want you to find yourself not getting enough of God's word. St. Augustine said this, Our hearts are restless until they find rest in God. Would you finally rest in His word? I wonder how restless you are when you distance yourself from God's word. Nothing else satisfies. Here's your take home. You know what? We all have awards and accomplishments that we have in our life, and I'm sure that you have them too. But there are not enough awards and accomplishments that will not leave us empty. We'll still be empty. Because we need Him. They're not going to help you to find true satisfaction. One, one, only spending time in your red letters are going to be able to find it. Will you ask God to cultivate the hunger and thirst that is placed inside of you? And then this next beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The world would say complacency is the word. The word the world says, blessed are those who never step up, think only of themselves, look out for number one. Jesus says it's about mercy. Mercy is the willingness to not impose a penalty or a loss to someone that has fully deserved the penalty or punishment. That's the end is. is there someone in your life that drives you crazy? Why not grant them some mercy? When others hurt you, would you pray God's blessings over that person? So if God wants to discipline him or her, he will, but you and I are supposed to pray blessings on people. You won't be merciful to others unless you're at, the, it's at your center and you're being a, you, you appreciate the fact that mercy has been given to you through God. You have been given what you don't deserve. And that's mercy. You know, there was a shooting in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago and uh, it was in church. People were, had lots of sisters. And back in the church, I was all stuff that we worry about, get scared about, I suppose. And uh, I'm thinking about all of this and all these reporters come into the place and they all had these microphones sticking them in their faces. What, so what do you think about this guy that did this stuff to you? And I said, we granted mercy. And of course, all the reporters are from that. What do you mean you granted mercy? What does that mean? Well, see, God gave us mercy that we didn't deserve in our response. And we can help but give him mercy back. It's not an option. It, it's not an option. And I, I, I watch how caring we are to people, like our compassion will give money to somebody, help somebody. Just last Sunday, we did Super Bowl Sunday, S O U P E O. And we gave Super so Thank you for doing that. There are lots of stories that were told, but this one is my favorite. My absolute favorite. There's a group in one of the places delivering soup door to the board, and they go to a lady's house and knock on the board, and there's soup. And this was what she said How did you know I didn't have food today? We didn't until just now. And so mercy was done by you so that we can give something to somebody else. But the best part of the mercy is yet to come. Because the family who was touched by that statement, when we get done with them in the soup, we'll go out and buy groceries for this lady and bring it back. We have to do that. Because it's the right thing to do. See, even football players have organizations in their name and foundations that raise money. And we look at them and they show us the videos of all the good stuff they do. We go, oh, you're so cool. No, it's human to help people. It's being human. If your house burns down, we're going to help you build your house. We're going to give you furniture. Why? Because we understand that our house could be the one that burned down. And we would sure love to have a home. You need a barn raise? We're going to raise your barn. It's the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's not compassion. It's not mercy. Here's mercy and compassion. The way I would deliver it the best way I could possibly do. The guy who wants into your car, you go help him. That's mercy. That guy doesn't deserve to be helped. He ruined my car. He ruined my life. I have all this insurance. I have to give. I have to give myself. You go help him. That's what Jesus did in the mercy. 
He handed mercy to us, and we don't deserve it. And that's mercy. Helping somebody is just human. It's the right thing to do. You're down your luck. Here's some money. Here's some food. That's what we do. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying if you really want to practice mercy, practice it on people that haven't been doing that to you. That's where you're going to learn it. So mercy. Why? Because we receive mercy that we don't deserve. And then this next one. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Man, who doesn't want to see God? That's a verse right there. So I'm going to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. But then I look at it and go, pure in heart? That's impossible. I'll never see God. Because I'll never be pure. That's what we think. Here's what the world says. Deception. The world says, blessed are those who create your own destiny by any means and deceive all the time. Jesus says, holiness... Jesus is looking at the inner person here. He's looking at where pure purity begins. Purity actually means the absence of contamination or pollution. And I know there's no way I can be that way. That's what the blood of Jesus says, okay? All the parts that I can't do myself on the impurity fills in the spots. He fills in all the gaps that I can't make happen. So as hard as I'm going to try to be pure, I'll still be impure, but he makes me pure because of his blood. The red part is what makes me that way. The Pharisees took him to task all the time between the internal and the external, outside parts of the life versus the inside. Because the outside were exceptionally clean. The inside was what he was always addressing. They wanted the world to see their clean hands while trying to hide their unclean hearts. They wanted to separate their private life from their public life. It's easier to avoid unclean hands like murder, stealing, and gluttony than an unclean heart like envy, pride, and bitterness. Ooh, now you're getting ugly. I never murdered anyone. Well, neither did I. But I have full pride. I have envy. I create anger in people. I get angry myself. But I want to talk about those. You know, we're sometimes more concerned about our physical fitness than our spiritual fitness. We'll work and spend tons of money. I'll make sure we stay physically fit. And we'll do very little be spiritually fit. Mm-hmm. Before our hands manifest what happens in our heart by what it is we choose to do. We have pure hands or a pure heart. And pure hearts are only possible by the cleansing blood of Jesus. So ask the Lord to search your heart on a daily basis, spending time in His presence and asking Him how you identify your pure thoughts and motives. We have plenty of cameras watching us now, and that means you're probably going to get caught. We're all probably going to get caught. And so here's the take home. Make sure that what you're working on today is what you can live with tomorrow. In other words, are you looking over your shoulder? And in this last area of blessings, there's only two of them, centered in serving God, last two. The one is called the peacemakers, and verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. The world says conflict. The world says, Blessed are the cruel and the malicious and the spiteful and the hurtful, for they establish their respect and nobody messes with them. Jesus says, be peacemakers. And Jesus blesses peacemakers, not peacekeepers. And that means we're not just to be sitting around appeasing men all the time, but if we can do to appease you, we do not seek peace at any price, but we seek to pursue the path of peace. There's a reward for being identified with Jesus. We're called sons and daughters of God. We're called His children because we're displaying His character of peace to other people. Are you one who avoids conflict? Or are you one who works through conflict? See, healthy conflict is necessary for growth. And what conflicts you're afraid to deal with might be the ones that you're very well able to address. In this last one, there's actually two blessings in two verses. So verse 10 and 11 say this, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The world would say compromise. The world would say, Blessed are those of you whom everyone loves. Jesus, on the other hand, says persecution is the word. The word rendered persecuted actually bears the root of pursue or chase. In essence, it means blessed are the harassed. Let's be honest. Jesus messes up our lives. Okay? Follow 
Birmingham and your infancy flock. During the first 300 years after the church was founded, more people were martyred than any other time because they said yes to following Jesus. And so that means in the first 300 years, the church, that church discipleship, then you're going to die for your faith. And if you're looking for something like that to make your life easier, you need to look somewhere else. I know, not a very good sales pitch for one to come to Christ. But I'm telling you, nothing different than what Jesus told us. Apparently, Jesus had no training in sales. He had no political coaching. Jesus doesn't play down persecution. He features it. You're going to get it. It's going to come. He says, blessed if you do it. The world is threatened by a Christian lifestyle. I get that. Our endurance during persecution will show others how to live for Jesus. And sometimes doing the right thing will bring you to trouble. Again, the Oregon shooting. A guy walks in. One person at a time makes him stand up. One person at a time. You love God. And he said, if they said yes, you're going to see him in one second. And one by one, he went down the road, and I thought to myself, what would I say to the enemy? I just watched what happened to everybody else. What would I say? But here's the question. The question isn't, are you willing to die for Jesus? The question, are you willing to live for Jesus? To stand up for him. See, Jesus switches in verse 11 from they to you. He went from talking about everybody else to just pointing at you. So before we were talking about the rest of the world, I suppose the Beatitudes now say to you, fearful church, you, 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 personalize his red letters falsely, and because of the are key words there, Jesus is saying, if folks say you're a nasty person and you are, you haven't been persecuted, you've just been accurately evaluated. Congratulations, you're nasty. Persecuted when the lies are, when the lies are connected with your faith in Christ. You see, at the center of your persecution, last take home, you won't find happiness until the cause of Christ becomes more important than your own cause. So here's a closing illustration in one song will be done. In New York City, there are millions of cats and dogs. However, New York City is basically just concrete and steel, so they have a pet in New York City, and it dies. You can't just go out in the backyard and bury it. And so the city authorities decided that for $50, they would dispose of your deceased pet for you. Well, then the lady was enterprising, and she thought, I can render a service to people in the city and save them some money. She placed the matter in the newspaper and said, when your pet dies, I will come and take care of the carcass for you for $25. And this lady would go to the local Salvation Army and buy an old suitcase for $2. And then she would call them up and get their pet, put it inside the suitcase, and she would take it on the ride on the subway where the thieves were. She would set the suitcase down and she wouldn't act like she was watching. A thief would come by and come and steal her suitcase and she'd say, look up and like, whoa, stop, thief. My guess is the people who stole those suitcases got a real surprise when they got home. You know, a lot of us are like those New York thieves. We're chasing after happiness. We'll grab whatever we think is going to give us happiness. I'll have when we get it. It doesn't quite do it. Jesus knew he'd come with what we He wanted us to know that he was the one who was going to deliver. And only he could heal. And only he could restore. And only he could unconditional love at the cross. And only Jesus can give complete grace. And only all of us who are attracted to him daily will find it. And because of that, we live to attract others to Jesus. We attract others who want that too. So what is it about your life that attracts others to Jesus? To your center. Did you get there yet? Did you find what you thought was there? This song is a song in close with you. Third day wrote the song. To everyone who's lost someone they love long before it was their time. You feel like the days you had were not enough when you say goodbye. With all the people with burdens and pains keeping you back from your life, you believe there's nothing and there's no one who can make it right. But there's hope for the helpless. Rest for the weary, love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness and mercy and healing and meet you wherever you are, cry out to Jesus. For the marriage that's struggling just to hang on, they've lost all their faith and love, and they've done all they can to make it right again, but it's still not enough. For the ones who can't break the addiction.
addictions and chains and try to give up and come back again. Just remember that you're not alone in your shame and your suffering. Because there's hope for the helpless and rest for the weary and love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness and mercy and healing to meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. When you're lonely and it feels like the whole world is falling on you, then you just reach out and you just cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. To the widow who suffers from being alone, wiping the tears from her eyes. And for the children around the world without a home, say a prayer tonight. There's hope for the helpless. Rest for the weary. Love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness and mercy and healing to meet you wherever you are. Rest for the weary. Cry out to Jesus. We come to this moment in our service. I beg you to cry out for him. The next several weeks we're going to be unpacking the Sermon on the Mount. And it's going to get ugly. I promise you, it's not fun to talk about, but we must live this way. We must live this way. And when we can't, and when we don't know what to do, at least we can say, Jesus, help me. At least we can cry out to him and say, we're not by ourselves. And we're not alone. Just make it in the center of our lives. And if you don't know Christ, I want you to come this time. If you don't have a family that you can honor your children, would you come? Would you say yes to him? Cry out to him. Let's stand and sing this song about how much we need you.